someone posted a comment on one of my videos about Ken Wheeler, and the comment contained a link to another channel, and this channel is called See the Pattern, and it's an interesting one. It is presented by a dude who is quite well-spoken, calm, and seemingly rather pleasant. In further contrast to Ken Wheeler, he also seems to have a much better understanding of physics, and he's less reliant on the word salad and all the other nonsense that Ken Wheeler spouts. Although his comment section does appear to get flooded by the same people as Ken Wheeler's comment section. He recently started a series of videos about the atom. So far, he has three videos in, or maybe four by the time this is released, I don't know. Uh, and it is becoming very clear what direction he is heading in, and I would be interested to see what he makes of it. Now, there are a few other videos on this channel, which are kind of cool, and I will address them at some point as well, as they present some interesting opportunities for some content. The creator behind Cedar Pattern subscribes to something called the Structured Atomic Model, developed by armchair physicist Edwin Carl. Now, for all you Dutch speakers out there, you will know why that surname is funny. Yeah, okay, I only have a few years left for where I can crack those jokes. I'm really making the most of it. Now, I will be honest, and I say that I really like this model. It is simple and rather pleasing. The only problem with it is that it is catastrophically wrong, but I won't give anything away yet, so you won't actually touch on it in the first two videos. Now, I will even skip the first video completely, as most of it is quite sensible. If you ignore the bits where he claims that he will explore the so-called major limitations of the current model, it is actually a decent video about the history of the development of the current model of the atom. But I also doubt that there are many people in my audience who don't already understand this at a far deeper level than how he treats it. So we start with video two called Fundamental Problems with Our Understanding of the Atom. Welcome to the second part of the Atomic series. In this episode, we will explore how our understanding of the atom has become fractured into a view of what goes inside of it versus how they react together in chemistry. This has led to some fundamental problems with our understanding of the atom. Two things right from the start, really. Um, the first is an opportunity to just point out that this guy struggles with attention to detail. Now, really, I promise you this is actually part two of the series. I wouldn't pick on this, I'm not too great on this myself, but it is a recurring theme. Secondly, given that this was his opening sentence, In this episode we will explore how our understanding of the atom has become fractured into a view of what goes inside of it versus how they react together in chemistry. I am willing to bet that he's going to talk about many problems that don't actually exist and completely ignore the ones that do exist. So far we have discussed the evolution of the model of the atom, but one very important aspect is to consider how atoms are used in science. For most of us, this is through chemistry. Understanding the structure of the atom does not explain the properties that we know elements have. Well, that is incorrect. I won't go into that yet, though. This will become apparent later. It was Mendeleev who was finally able to structure the elements into what we know today as the periodic table. In 1863, there were 53 known elements, with new ones being discovered every year. Other scientists had identified a periodicity to the elements so far discovered. Mendeleev's breakthrough came in a dream where he saw all the elements arranged in a table. He was able to identify, firstly, that elements when arranged by their atomic weight exhibit periodicity of properties. Elements which have a similar chemical property either have similar atomic weights or have their atomic weights increasing regularly. The arrangement of the atoms in order of atomic weight corresponds to the structure of their electrons and also their distinctive chemical properties. Atomic weight. Do you want to consider rephrasing that perhaps? Now here is carbon-14 and here is nitrogen-14. Or we can take beryllium-14. Almost the same atomic mass. Very different chemical properties though. I wouldn't really make a point of this, and in the first edit I didn't, because I just took it as him conflating atomic mass with atomic number. Unfortunately, I'm becoming increasingly distrusting towards the Electric Universe nutters, and the reason why is very clear in this guy's production. The problem with the Electric Universe is not that they lie. 
It's that they create presentations which tend to mix correct information with outright bullshit. And I use the word bullshit carefully. I'm not saying that they are lying, but that they just don't care enough about the truth to do a bit of reading around the subject, to check what they are saying is actually correct. The table would allow for the prediction of as yet undiscovered chemicals and their properties, which could be predicted from their atomic weight. And what is important to realise from the periodic table is that when we add a proton to the nucleus, it doesn't just change the charge, but it can change the properties and the behaviours of that element. You started off by saying that the structure of the atom does not explain the properties of the atom. But here you are saying that the number of protons, a key part of the structure of the atom, determines properties and behaviour of the element. This continues as you move across the periodic table, meaning elements at one end of the table have very different properties from those at the other end. And these are things like the melting point, the boiling point, conductivity, reactivity, etc. But now, once we reach the end of the table, if we add one more proton, we jump back to the start, and the properties are once again similar to those above it. The pattern repeats in a cycle of eight, and there are no good explanations in the standard model as to why this happens. Now, I hope that you are using the phrase standard model as to mean the generally accepted theory and not actually the standard model. The standard model is of very little use at this point, but you are also wrong in saying that we don't know why this happens. And this is a common theme with the electric universe or plasma cosmology types. They pick up on a pattern and claim that the established theory cannot explain it, even though it does. And in this case, it is really fucking simple, or at least the idea is simple. The maths isn't. If an electron comes into an atom, then it will occupy the lowest available energy state. Now, Overall, the lowest energy state in an atom is the 1s orbital, and this is a spherically symmetric shell that can take two electrons, one with spin up and one with spin down. The next lowest energy state is the 2s orbital, which is another spherically symmetric shell, but this time a bit larger. When the 2s orbital is full, the next lowest available energy state are the 2p orbitals, which have a weird dumbbell shape. And there are three of them and these fill up in a very specific way. Each additional electron goes into a separate orbital, and only once all three have one electron, an orbital will take the additional electron. Once the 2p orbitals have filled, the next lowest energy state is the 3s orbital, and following that, the 3p orbital. And there should be a pattern emerging now. When describing these orbitals, I used a number and a letter, and we can take the number to refer to the period, or the row, on the periodic table. We have a 1s, but not a 1p. And there are two electrons that can fit in that 1s orbital, so there are two states in this period. The first period contains two elements, corresponding to hydrogen and helium. But then we have 2s and 2p, two states in the s orbitals, and six states in the p orbitals. The second period contains eight elements. And then we move on to the third period, where we have 3s and 3p. The third period also contains eight elements. At least if you ignore the 3d orbitals, as these take a total of 10 electrons, but in the periodic table, 3d sits in the fourth row because the 4s orbital is actually lower energy than the 3d orbitals. So here is your cycles of 8 pattern though, although that falls apart when you include the DNF orbitals. As for where this pattern comes from, well, every state is a solution to the Schrodinger equation. Yes, the thing that you claim that physics cannot explain is actually very well understood in terms of one of the most basic equations in physics. You also listed some examples of properties that follow distinct patterns in the periodic table. The issue is that they don't. The melting point, boiling point, and conductivity are all a little bit more complicated, and these are all determined by interatomic forces and the lattice structures, in other words, condensed matter physics. Considering that you are trying to argue that chemistry and physics are two disciplines that are incompatible with each other, we sure do find that a lot of chemistry seems to be explained through physics. Almost as if you haven't really understood what you're talking about. 
We tend to take this for granted, but there are some big differences that occur with the addition of a proton. Intrinsically linked to this are the electrons. As we add protons, we have to add additional electrons to the atom. Some electrons are easy to remove and some are much harder. And when we perform chemical reactions, we are creating compounds that cause the electrons to be partially shared. These are the chemical bonds. Nuclear reactions will change the composition of the nucleus by either joining two nuclei together or splitting larger ones apart. At some point in the development of the atomic and subatomic models, both camps seem to have moved further away from each other. There are a set of rules that apply to chemistry. We know certain reactions will occur under certain conditions. Being able to explain these in terms of physics is a little harder to do. Now, this is a bass guitar, obviously, and I can kind of play it. I know that if I pluck this string, the string will vibrate with a fundamental frequency of 55 hertz, and I know that if I repeat this whilst pressing down on the seventh fret, the string vibrates with a frequency of 82 hertz. Now, I know that the string vibrating makes the pickups vibrate, and that creates an electrical signal, which is carried by a cable to my audio interface, which is then converted into a digital signal and stored onto my hard drive. Everything that I said can be described using quantum mechanics, but the computational power required to do so would be ridiculous. And even if such power were available, it would be a pointless exercise. Knowing all of that is absolutely unnecessary when you were just trying to record a piece to stick in a video to demonstrate a point and maybe get Davy 504 to slap like. Just like it was unnecessary for me to describe the basic laws of physics to record that baseline, it is not necessary for a chemist to concern themselves with subatomic particles. Don't be mistaken, the rules of chemistry are absolutely determined by the laws of physics and the two did not move further away from each other. There is no discrepancy between chemistry and physics and in fact the lines between the disciplines are becoming increasingly blurry. We understand the rules, but struggle to be able to build the models that would predict these in a quantum world. A chemist does not require subatomic particles to be able to predict the outcome of a reaction. A physicist struggles to use the subatomic particles and the random nature of the quantum realm to accurately predict the outcome of these reactions. Well, yes, the issue is around what questions you are asking. Physics concerns itself with the underlying mechanisms. Chemistry is interested in the emergent phenomena. As a rule of thumb, chemists are interested in the interactions between a large number of particles. Physicists are interested in the interactions between the constituent parts of a single atom. When we take a first principles approach and deal with individual molecules and try to apply physics to determine what happens, we have to deal with quantum mechanics. The problem is that we end up with probabilities as to what happens. Now, why can a chemist accurately predict what reaction happens? Because they deal with large numbers. Just to really highlight the problem, here is a Monte Carlo simulation that we will use as an analogy. Pay attention, Ken, this is what an analogy should be like. We have a board with some pegs in it. I will drop a ball at the center at the top and see where it lands when it hits the bottom. I can make a prediction as to where it lands, but it is very unlikely that it will land where I say it will. And this is because there are multiple outcomes possible. And this is kind of the key point with quantum mechanics. But when we repeat this a thousand times, we can create a histogram describing where the ball lands. The physicist is interested in the individual ball, and therefore by taking the physicist approach, it becomes very difficult to make these predictions. A chemist, on the other hand, is not too interested in the individual balls. They want lots of balls. In this analogy, their prediction is not about what each individual ball would do, but the shape of the distribution that the histogram forms. Now, what I have shown here are some really simple random walks that a 10 year old could feasibly program in Python. The equations from a physics perspective are a little bit more complicated and with complexity comes computational power. But 
we have reached a point where models built from first principles using quantum mechanics have been verified experimentally. Here is a video of one of these reactions happening. The video shows dimerization of fullerene molecules. For all the chemists, a uh, link to the paper is in the description. Unfortunately, it is not open access. The video I'm commenting on was written and recorded earlier this year. The paper I reference was published in 2017. Now, I wouldn't expect just any person off the street to be aware of the development, but if you are making a presentation where you claim to show how the established theory is incorrect, you need to show that you understand and are up to date with the developments in the field especially considering that the problem he highlights was never actually taken as a gap in our understanding, but more as a gap in our ability to perform these calculations with the available computational resources. That being said, we are still a long way away from doing this for any arbitrary chemical reaction, and the biggest challenge is still that computational power. In other words, I need to stop making YouTube videos and get the fuck back to work. So with that, I'm going to do that, exactly. And there is more on this video, but that will come later, as I ended up getting on my soapbox for quite a bit. I would like to thank my patrons, who absolutely know who they are, and of course my newest patron, Martel Duvigneau. You guys are awesome, and you really help me keep this channel going. But of course, to everyone else, you guys also fucking rule. So you'll see me soon.